Yeah. All right. Right. Hey, gentlemen, we are. Our mics are live. Oh, we're doing the full. We're doing the full joint. I could tell. <laughs> I'd like to call this meeting to order at 6.30 on October the 5th, 2020. This is our regularly scheduled Danville Community School Board of Trustees meeting. Uh, I'd like to know if there are any uh, amendments to the agenda. Uh, did you want to begin with uh, Yeah, that? I will in okay. just a second. Uh, no, I have no amendments to request this evening. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Um, actually, before we start the meeting, uh, it's typical that we, uh, traditional, that we start the meeting out with the Lord's Prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you all feel inclined to join us. We'll start out with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Okay, hearing no amendments to the agenda. Does the board have any amendments to the agenda? Okay, hearing none, we're moving on. Um, our favorite part of this meeting, and golly, it's been a long, long time uh, since we've been able to do this, and uh, so it's good to have some sort of normalcy this evening, but uh, item 2A on the agenda is uh, Students of the Month, so we'll start out with North Elementary, please. Thanks. Um, this is our, second, our student of the month, North Elementary, second grader Harper Kinkler. I'm so excited to introduce Ms. Harper Kinkler to you. Harper shared with me that she has two favorite parts of her day, learning, learning math like addition and reading books that are challenging. From there, we had a pretty long discussion about reading books. Harper likes reading Dogman books, My Weird School books, and Mo William books. She reads outside, she reads in a homey reading quarter, and she reads to her little brother Calvin. She loves to read. If Harper could change one thing to make North Elementary better, she would help her peers understand that it's not okay to be worried or to act out. When Harper grows up, she thinks she would like to be a police officer. To be more specific, she would like to be a school resource officer because she likes to help people and thinks that it looks like a cool job. When she is not in school, Harper likes to go bike riding with her dad, and her favorite thing about her family is that they spend time together and they love each other. If Harper could do anything, for a whole day, she would wake up and practice her spelling words before eating breakfast, watch some TV, read, ride her bike outside, and then after supper, she would read before bed. She loves to read. Harper's teacher, Mrs. Steerwalt, says, Harper is a kind and thoughtful student. She is always looking for ways to help others, and she always approaches everyone with a smile. Harper gets along with everyone. She is often the first to include others. She is very polite and respectful and has a soft manner about her. Harper is also a dedicated student. You can always count on her to be listening, to answer questions, and do additional work whenever she gets a chance. She works hard to produce quality work, and it is an absolute, absolute pleasure to have her in our classroom. Harper, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Perkins and Harper. Mrs. No? Stand behind you and talk about you. All right. 
South Elementary is proud to introduce Hunter Wilson as this month's Student of the Month. Hunter is a third grader in Mrs. McDougall's class and is the son of Josh Wilson. Hunter shared that he enjoys recess, specials, and science most while at school, but at home his favorite activity includes boating at Raccoon Lake. If he could do anything in the world that he wanted, Hunter said he would visit Disney World and go to Legoland. When asked who has been the greatest influence on his life, he said that it's his parents because they are kind and they help people by fixing things for them. When Hunter grows up, he said he would like to be a YouTuber so that he can bring joy to kids and cheer people up. Hunter was nominated by the staff at North Elementary who felt slighted by the end of the year not being able to bring someone forward, and his teacher this year would agree that he is a wonderful candidate. Mrs. Styers from North Elementary writes that Hunter Wilson is always respectful and responsible. He displays respect for adults and peers alike. He is genuinely kind and willing to help anyone in need. He is a student who always wants to do the right thing. Hunter takes personal responsibility as a student and is ready to learn each and every day in the classroom. He listens, follows directions, and participates in class discussions. He sets personal goals to do better in and out of the classroom, and he, ha he asks the most interesting questions, such as what is, what's the largest squid in the ocean, challenging adults to do Google searches and also learn something new. Mrs. Perkins shared that from the time that Hunter set foot in our school as a kindergarten student, he exhibited exceptional manners and kindness. Over the years, his confidence grew, allowing him to advocate for himself when he had concerns, and he became a true support for his peers. Hunter made quite an impression on very best and represents the best of Danville schools by his excellent citizenships. Congratulations to Hunter on being South Elementary's first student of the month this year. Congratulations. Mrs. Webster. Right. Danville Community Middle School celebrates one student from the student body who stands out among her peers. This month, we honor sixth grader Madeline Newman, who goes by Maddie, with our Student of the Month Award. Maddie is the oldest daughter of Scott and Ashley Newman, and Maddie also has a sister, Olivia, in kindergarten, and two pet beagles, Lucy and Buddy. Maddie has only been a Danville warrior since her fifth grade year but she's already making a positive and lasting impression on her staff and peers. Maddie said she knew she would love Danville right away as all the people she met were kind and friendly. In fact, the first girl that Maddie met in the car rider line at school remains her best friend today. Maddie enjoys school, loves learning and spending time with her friends. Her favorite class is math because she loves to solve problems and understanding math comes easy for her. Maddie is also a member of the girls' cross-country team and the yearbook club. By the way, she came from the county cross-country team, <laughs> where our team placed fourth. She didn't know her individual uh, place yet. Outside of school, Maddie splits her free time between fast-pitch travel softball and horse lessons. Maddie plays for the primetime travel softball team as a pitcher and a first baseman. When at her horse lessons, Maddie practices barrel racing and show jumping. Maddie admitted that over all, she just loves the thrill of competing. She went on to say that one of her favorite parts of horse lessons and barrel racing is the speed part. She gets excited and wants to push herself to make it around all three barrels. Maddie's teachers gush about her performance as a student. Reading teacher Mrs. Parent says this, though we've only just begun the school year, Maddie has already stood out as an eager conscientious student. She always has a positive contribution during class lessons, is respectful with her peers, and is an overall asset to our class. 
Her academic achievement, achievement has been impressive so far with a 100% in English language arts. Mrs. Carlton, math teacher, adds, Maddie is an amazing student and even more important, a wonderful person. She has a strong work ethic, participates in class discussions, and asks questions pertinent to the content. She's friendly, outgoing, and always has a smile. She's goal-oriented and pushes herself to be successful. Currently in math, she has a 97.9% with missing only one point on a quiz. Maddie is an absolute joy to teach. At this time, Maddie is interested in becoming a veterinarian. She loves all animals and wants to be around them. She explained that when watching the television show Dr. Pole in the summer, and she added only when it was raining, it created a desire for her to work with both large and small animals and help them in any way that she can. My sincere congratulations go to Maddie and her family for Maddie being an exceptional student at Danville Community Middle School. Thank you, Dr. Hallman. <laughs> I'm a little bit taller than my counterpart, so. When Vince Lombardi started coaching the Green Bay Packers, he told his team that they would be successful if they focused on three things and only three things, your God, your family, and the Green Bay Packers. When I interviewed Hayala Oliver, our student of the month, she shared that she too focused on three things, her God, her family, and her academics. Hayala is one of nine children in the Oliver household, and she is forever grateful that her parents brought her here. She admires them so much and appreciates all they do for her and her siblings. They help her stay grounded and help her to reach her goals that she has set for herself. For example, she has a goal of making all A's this year, and she also wanted to become recognized as Student of the Month sometime this year. Hayala's English teacher, Mrs. Long, noticed the effort that she was putting in this year and believed that it needed to be recognized. Mrs. Long stated Hayala's work ethic and tenacity separate her from her peers. She pushes herself not only to succeed, but to learn from, the, the, learn from and use her mistakes as opportunities to grow. The academic drive she displays each and every day is more than worthy of this recognition. In the future, Hayala hopes to become an independent journalist. As a freshman, she took our journalism class and she had the opportunity to interview DCHS Alumni Hall of Fame member, Gary Varvel. During this interview, he shared with her that she had the ability to become a great reporter. What he noticed was that Hayala is quietly confident, and this trait makes it really easy to open up to her. While she may be reserved in sharing her own feelings, she is a fantastic listener. Varvel probably noticed that people will naturally gravitate toward her and be willing to share things with her that make for great stories. Mrs. Spence, Hayala's journalism and yearbook teacher, stated that this article demonstrated her talent and excitement for writing. Mrs. Spence also noticed that Hayala is passionate and dedicated, and this is evident in her work, which will be seen and read for years to come in the published pages of the yearbook. I will not be, it will, I will not be surprised when Hayala becomes the first DCHS alum to win the Pulitzer Prize for Investigative Journalism. Congratulations on being our student of the month. Well, thank you so much for, for coming. And I want to just say a quick thing for a quick comment about Harper and Hunter and Maddie and Hayala. Uh, first of all, I know that you all are sometimes, it's a little nerve wracking to stand up in front of so many people, but uh, just uh, Take a deep breath and get used to it, because I can tell because of the, the hard work that you're putting in, whether it's uh, at North, South, or Middle School or High School, you're going to be recognized many times uh, as young people and as adults. And uh, so uh, just hang in there and keep at it. I want to also thank uh, your parents and guardians for uh, sharing you with our Danville Community School family. Uh, it's students like yourselves 
that really do make a big difference and your leaders amongst your peers and uh, you bring everyone along with you. So thank you so much for your work. I do want to talk with a few of you afterwards because I have to know from Hunter if you can catch fish in Raccoon Lake because I never do. Uh, journalism's always been a favorite of mine and uh, I probably have not read as many books um, already <laughs> as, as Harper it sounds like if she's reading several a day possibly. And, um, and, and welcome, Maddie, to our schools. Uh, glad that you could join us this year and uh, look forward to you doing a lot of great things at Danville uh, on into the future. Um, typically at this time, what we do is we take a short recess so that those of you who uh, would need to go home and would like to uh, leave at this time can. We invite any and every one of you to stay if you'd like, uh, but we'll take a five minute uh, break and then get started with the other part of our meeting. Thank you.
Okay. Gentlemen ready? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Uh, do we have a motion to uh, item uh, agenda item 3A to approve the uh, minutes as presented? So moved. We have a first. Do we have a second? Second. Second. All those, any discussion? Questions, changes? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries four to zero. Uh, agenda item 4A, Treasurer's Report. Mr. Parkinson. The September 30th fund balance and our property and state tax supported funds was $7,569,175. The education fund had actual expenditures of $1,320,279.71. Uh, no, no expenditures in debt service. Operations had expenditures of $700,354.59. Uh, we transferred $201,885.05 from education to operations last month. Uh, and with the board's approval, we'll do the same plus a penny this month. Uh, I take this opportunity, too, to um, inform the board. Uh, October is a three-pay month, so we're going to see some higher expenditures this month uh, for payroll purposes. Uh, we also hopefully are going to get the um, teacher compensation in increase in place at the um, end of September, and we have a couple large expenditures relating to special education services with, with Wayne Township. So uh, just kind of in anticipation, this is going to be a high expenditure month in particular in the education fund. Yeah, very good. Any questions for Mr. Parkinson? Hearing none, we'll move to quarterly report, Mr. Parkinson. Uh, at the end of the third quarter, the school corporation that spent or encumbered 66% of the education fund. Um, this is compared to 70 1% this time last year. At the end of the second quarter, the school corporation had spent or encumbered 57% of the operations fund. I don't have the percentage from last year, but it, it was significantly higher. Um, as we discussed at the, at the budget hearing, we've, um, we've been careful in particular about capital expenditures um, this cycle, and, and as a result, we're, we're well under budget for the year. Any questions? Yeah, is that also due to some uh, lower expenses last spring when buildings weren't being yep. operated and things? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a factor for sure. We, we saved, I estimated around $100,000 on, uh, on electric and, and um, fuel uh, last March, April, May, and so that's certainly coming into play as well. Other questions? Uh, we changed this about a year ago, but um, I'd like a motion to receive both the treasurer's report and the quarterly report. So moved. Dr. Beatty, do we have a second? Second. Mr. Mason, any more discussion, questions? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries 4-0. Uh, agenda item 4C, approval of claims. Mr. Parkinson. Uh, this month for the, the board's approval, we have $62,989.80 in pre-written claims. $350,773.83 in traditional vouchers for a total of $413,763.63. And I'd ask your approval for these claims. Do we have a motion to approve the claims? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. All right. All right. Questions or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries 4-0. All right, see if you can go four for four. Okay. Payroll claims. <laughs> Two payrolls this month. Uh, September 18th payroll was $539,263.89. Uh, the October 2nd payroll, $552,300.90. Total for the month, $1,094,564.79. Uh, and again, just extra reminder, we're going to have three payrolls um, in the month of October. October 2nd was the first of those three. Uh, do we have a motion to accept the payroll claims as presented? So moved. Mr. Mason, do we have a second? Second. Dr. Beatty, any questions or discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries four to zero. Old business. There is none on the, uh, the list. Uh, new business. Consider approval of classified employee handbook, Mr. Parkinson. So this is a, a task that the administration and school board take on um, periodically as, as a need arises to, to modify um, the handbook that guides the school corporation's relationship with, with classified employees. So just for definition purposes, a classified employee um, at a school district is anybody who's not, not licensed as a teacher. 
Uh, we made a number of changes, uh, many of them technical. There's a lot of things we're replacing um, former te terminology with, with newer terminology. Uh, but I thought I'd run through just a few of the, the kind of policy level changes that we uh, were suggesting that we implement. Um, the first is uh, adding a second Title IX coordinator. So school districts are required to have both um, a male and a female Title IX coordinator. So um, Sarah Smith, uh, we're proposing is, she's the human resources coordinator, proposing adding her as the uh, female Title IX coordinator. Uh, it, places where there are references to time cards, in, in almost all cases we're doing um, electronic timekeeping. That's a, a change that we've made that's, that's made payroll much more efficient, um, especially as we implemented, um, well, Frontline uh, and, and sort of the newer version of Compu-Troll. So just some change in the terminology away from, from pay for time cards to um, electronic timekeeping. Uh, the, the change that's probably most significant in terms of, of what it means for, for a number of employees is Section 315. Um, what we're doing here is, is formalizing something that we've done kind of in pay practice outside of the classified handbook. There are certain employees around the district, classified employees, who as a result of their position receive supplemental pay on top of their hourly rate. Um, so the, the types of positions that we're referring to particularly timely this year is the corporation nurse. Uh, we provide supplemental pay for the corporation nurse. There, there's a lot of responsibility there, especially this year, of course, in terms of reporting to the county health department and reporting to the state. Um, we also provide supplemental pay for instructional assistants who, um, who serve in uh, life skills classrooms. Uh, we provide a little bit of supplemental pay for um, bus aides who hold a, um, a CDL and a yellow card, allowing them to drive a bus. And then there's one that's, that's new that we've introduced that we think is, is um, worthwhile. Uh, we'd like to propose a, um, an additional $5 per day for uh, bus aides who have a certification or a skill um, that's relevant to uh, providing service on the bus. So, so at our school corporation, the bus aides assist with special education students. Um, in particular, um, we've identified a need for um, American Sign Language skills for communicating with students who, um, you know, who need that, that type of assistance. And so one of the things that we've incorporated into the handbook and we're asking for your approval is to provide a $5 per day um, supplemental pay for those employees. Uh, and then finally, there's some updated language um, from the Department of Education that, that refers to um, how cases of, of child abuse and neglect should be reported. Happy to answer any questions anybody has about the handbook. Questions, discussion? For purposes of transparency to the constituents, can you explain what Title IX is and what those duties are? Yeah, uh, well, I can. I don't know if Dr. Schaefer probably better. Yeah, it's just uh, making sure there's equity uh, between uh, gender um, for uh, boys and girls and men and women uh, in our school corporation. And you have to have a, a compliance person, two people actually, in place in case there's ever a complaint or dispute about an inequity. Uh, so we have to, in policy, uh, have someone appointed, which in, the, in our case, the compliance officer duties have uh, traditionally fallen upon our CFO position. And then, as, as Mr. Parkinson pointed out, we would add uh, Sarah Smith to that. And that way, if there's ever an investigation that needs to be held internally, we are uh, positioned to do that fairly. And that includes not just the education side of things, but also the athletic side. That's of correct. Concern. All aspects. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I have a question in particular. The, the changes made with regards to child abuse and neglect reporting, could you highlight those a little bit further? Sure. So a lot of what we're getting at with child abuse uh, neglect reporting is we have responsibilities to report to the Department of Child Services um, if we identify that there's a potential for something. We, we don't have the option to sit on it um, and, and to not report. And so what we're doing is really solidifying in here that we have a responsibility as employees if we see something to say something, escalating it upward and making sure that it gets um, to the authorities who can take action. So basically, I mean, we've already trained our, our teachers and certified staff to do this, but mainly we're just making the change to our policy so that it's written. Correct. Other questions? All right, hearing none, I'd like a motion uh, to approve the changes to the classified employee handbook. Um, oh, actually, this was more of a um, this was more of an informational 
uh, discussion for this evening. This is actually, uh, we'd like to have the board go ahead and take action and approve uh, the updates to the classified handbook. Sure. Okay, great. Um, especially since they're not major changes. Um, so having, uh, having this presented, I'd like a motion to approve the classified employee handbook uh, changes as presented by Mr. Parkinson. So moved. All right. We have a first, we have a second. Second. Mr. Mason, any more discussion or questions? Before we uh, vote, okay. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries four to zero. Thank you. Um, item 6C, consider, uh, sorry, 6B, consider approval of personnel recommendations, Dr. Schaefer. Yes, and the uh, personnel recommendations are uh, presented there uh, for the board to review and would recommend approval of those as submitted. Any questions? Do we have a motion to approve the personnel recommendations as uh, submitted to the board? So moved. All right, Dr. Beatty, do we have a second? Second. All right. Mr. McRoberts, any more questions? No, hearing none. I, I have a question. Okay. All right, I, I was just, where are we at with um, bus drivers? We were down a couple. I mean, we, um, and Mr. Parkinson, probably gave you a more detailed uh, update, but um, we are, we have. Two that are getting, I believe two, uh, that are getting near licensing. And we have three additional bus drivers who have at least expressed interest or have begun uh, their training process. And it's a, that's a multi-week process. We are hoping to get a little bit more support here by the end of fall break, uh, just because it has been very short-staffed. Uh, we ran a double route, complete double route today. We have another half double route to run tomorrow. When I say that, uh, we'll have some kids on one bus uh, about 20, 30 minutes late tomorrow because we, we don't have drivers. And uh, uh, Mrs. Parsons, our director, is out on medical leave right mm -hmm. now, so it's it's very, very tight. And I, 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 wanna, I want to applaud <laughs> our bus drivers for helping each other out. And uh, Dawn, our um, secretary there, has kind of temporarily taken over some of those duties and just doing an outstanding job of communicating with each other and parents. We really appreciate their their teamwork. So we're still short, but hopefully some light. Yes, a little bit of light uh, road, we're, we're seeing, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of uh, approving the personnel recommendations as reported signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries four to zero. Agenda item 6C, consider approval of the 2021 school corporation budget, Mr. Parkinson. So we'll move through this at a pretty high level, uh, given that we had the, the public hearing where we went into a lot of depth on, on this topic. Um, so in terms of the process, uh, our responsibility is to advertise um, the proposed budget. Um, we did that back on September 9th. We held a public hearing on September 23rd. Um, and what we're asking the school board to do this evening is to adopt the budget that was um, present, presented in that advertisement uh, and discussed at the public hearing. Uh, from here, if the, the school board adopts it, we will submit this information to the State Department of Local Government Finance. Uh, and sometime between now and the end of the year, the state will uh, provide to us what's known as a 1782 notice. Uh, we have the opportunity within that 1782 notice window to make any modifications that we need to. Uh, and then at that point, DLGF will, will certify what's our final approved budget from the state, um, hopefully sometime by the end of calendar year 2020, um, so that we would enter calendar year 2021 with an approved um, budget, levy, and tax rate. Um, what's worth noting is um, we're expecting from a tax rate perspective, um, we're expecting when we're certified to have um, a slightly lower operations fund tax rate and, and a debt service tax rate that's lower by, by somewhere between one and four cents per hundred dollars in debt assessed value, um, all while funding, of course, the, the North Elementary project. Uh, and then statutorily, this is a, a pretty new requirement, but we need to make sure that we get this in um, in, in terms of the meeting minutes for, for our state requirement. Uh, we're required, or the board is required to state um, during this meeting whether we anticipate transferring more or less than 15% of our education fund revenue from the education fund to the operations fund. Um, and it is our intent to transfer less than 15% from education to operations next year. Um, specifically, we're projecting $2,467,711, um, most accurately. We'll, we'll take a look at what our education fund revenue is our tuition support in particular, uh, and make adjustments as we need to throughout the year. Happy to answer any questions about the budget, uh, but otherwise I'd ask for your approval. 
I submit it. Very good. We'll take a, a motion and we'll have discussion. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the budget as presented? So moved. Mr. Mason, do we have a second? Second. Dr. Beatty, questions, discussion? I, when you said something about moving money from the education fund. It's, did you mean debt service? Uh, I, meant, I meant education in that, in that instance. Um, what we're required to do is state how much we'll transfer from education to operations. But I appreciate you bringing that point up. We, we do... Um, we have a debt that we refinanced uh, back in probably 2015 uh, that annually lets us transfer a portion of those refinance savings from debt service over to operations. And so one of the things that we're also asking the board to approve with this budget is that ability to make that transfer from the debt service fund to the operations fund. It used to be a significant transfer, a large transfer for us, um, you know, eight, nine hundred thousand dollars in some cases. It's going to be closer to fifty and sixty thousand dollars per year moving forward, uh, but we'd still like to make that transfer. And that's that's the increment transfer. Any other questions, discussion? Obviously, we had this public meeting last Wednesday and discussed this, and obviously many times before that. But if you have any more uh, questions for Mr. Parkinson today, well, all right. Uh, hearing none before, um, just to, to be compliant with code, because it says it sits the board, I guess. <laughs> um, we, we are uh, planning to uh, not transfer more than 15% of the education fund revenue into operations. Um, it'll actually be less for our school corporation. We're projecting a transfer of $2,467,711 for calendar year 2021, which is 15% of projected tuition support and just under 15% of estimated education fund revenue. Um, okay, so um, stating that for code. Uh, any more questions? All right, hearing none, all those in favor of passing uh, the budget uh, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries four to zero. Thank you, Mr. Parkinson. Again, uh, item 6D, consider approval of resolution for the 2021-2023 capital projects plan. We're required to adopt a capital projects plan uh, resolution if we intend to spend more than $10,000 out of the operations fund. Um, on any single project or single asset. Um, this is another one that we discussed at the same hearing. Um, we have more projects and more assets listed than, than we'll be able to take on. Uh, but, but, you know, we do have capital needs around the school district, um, and so we'd ask for your approval of the, the plan as presented and discussed at the public hearing. Okay, do we have a motion to approve the capital projects plan? So moved. All right, we have first by Mr. McRoberts. Do we have a second? Second. Dr. Beatty, questions, discussion? I think it's really important to, to note that th this is a, 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 an estimated list. This is a, a list that we're providing the state as a part of our plan, our budgeting process. And obviously, as we move forward in the months into next year, uh, the school board will be making decisions on uh, how to prioritize that list. Because the list as it's presented in front of us is not prioritized as to a uh, level of importance, um, but uh, this at least gives us a, a budget to work from and, a, and a, basically an outline with regards to capital projects, correct? Agreed. Okay. Any other questions or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the uh, 2021 um, tw through 2023 capital projects plan uh, signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries four to zero. Uh, agenda item 6E, consider approval of resolution for the 2021 through 2025 bus replacement plan. Mr. Parkinson. The bus replacement plan is in the same mold. Uh, we're required to, um, to approve a resolution regarding the bus replacement plan if we anticipate replacing school buses out of the operations fund. Uh, we've listed three school buses per year uh, for the next five years to be replaced out of the operations fund. Uh, and, and we may. The, the more likely case is that we're going to, to look at some old general obligation bond proceeds to fund at least um, some of those school bus replacements. Uh, but, but even so, three buses per year out of the operations fund is, is a safe amount to say that we're not going to exceed, at least in 2021. Very good. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the uh, bus replacement plan for 2021 through 2025? So moved. Dr. Beatty, do we have a second? Second. Mr. Mason, questions, discussion? 
just like to point out for the record, this plan is uh, presented every year and just another year is added on to it. So last year we presented the 2020 to 2024 bus replacement plan. And uh, we don't always hit our mark, meaning we don't always spend the amount of money that we say that we're gonna spend, um, but this is the budget up to three for at least 2021, correct? That's correct. All right, any other questions? Comments, hearing none, all those in favor by, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Aye, all opposed, same sign. Motion carries four to zero. Uh, agenda item 6F, consider approval of membership agreement with CIESC, Mr. Parkinson. So this is an item that, that we have been considering at the, um, at the administration office for, for a number of months now. Um, the CIESC is the Central Indiana Educational Service Center. Um, it's a collaborative group of school corporations throughout central Indiana, um, large school districts and small school districts. Uh, Danville has not been a part of one in the past. CIESC, um, it provides several benefits to its, um, to its members. The, the most important one, at least from a financial perspective, is, is cooperative purchasing. Um, so so they, take, uh, they take all of the school corporations and bargain on behalf of the school districts with vendors. Um, and in an effort to secure lower prices. Uh, and they've been successful. The, the test case that we were looking at when we were considering membership was Hamilton Heights. Um, Hamilton Heights is a school corporation really similar to ours. It's geographically similar just to the north of Indianapolis instead of to the west. Um, Profile-wise, pretty similar. They, they're close to the same number of students that we have. Uh, and over the last several years, they've more than recouped um, their costs for membership. Uh, and, and we believe that we're going to do the same. And then the other thing that makes this really timely right now is um, the CIESC board um, is, is considering, and, and we have reason to believe, is, is quite likely to um, cut in half the annual cost for participating in um, CIESC for the next two years. And that's as a result of some extra revenue they've had from online courses. Um, a lot of school districts, including ourselves, uh, participate in Indiana Online, which is a service provided by um, CIESC. Uh, so instead of paying $4 per student, we would expect over the next two years to be paying $2 per student. Uh, and again, we're, we're confident we're going to more than recoup that in cost savings. And so we think it's a creative vehicle uh, to, to try to lower some costs, and uh, we're excited about the opportunity. Very good. Do we have a, a motion to approve the uh, uh, agreement um, to uh, enter into an agreement with CIESC? So moved. First, we have a second. Second. All right. Any questions or discussion? On the annual membership dues, that's it's your total ADM, not just those students doing online learning, correct? That's correct. correct. It, it would be that times $4 in a normal year, that presumably times $2 for the next two years. Right. One of the services that CISC offers is the online school component, and they've done a tremendous job with that and growing that. So those proceeds from all the districts that take part in that come back to the service center many of those funds are then redistributed back to the member schools. So there's a real benefit in that because I, I believe that membership has been pretty cost neutral uh, over the last two to three years because of the success of their online school. And again, that's, that's, that's not a charter. That's, those are all just normal public schools taking part in that when students need to pick up credits, just like we're doing right now with our high school students. What is the uh, cooperative purchasing? What all does that entail? Uh, a pretty pretty wide array. Um, I would think it would go anywhere from school buses to uh, school supplies and yep. everything in between. Does that get into our milk and bread purchases? It, it can. Now we're we're purchasing okay, through the West Central country. Cooperative right now. That's something we could look at. Whether we that was going to be my next question mm -hmm. is, are we going to be leaving that cooperative since we're getting into this? We'll have to see. We'll have to, I think we'll look at the history of what those bids have been to give us a better idea and what the purchasing uh, power is. I'm not even sure we've even had that discussion yet, but I have thought about that. I think we'd want to look and see where we can be most competitive. Okay. One other component, it's a strong component of all the service centers, is professional development uh, for our teachers and staff that's available through the service centers. Uh, along with the networking, there's a lot of other professional services. So it, it's a really good thing for school districts to be members particularly particularly at this cost. Other questions? Any other questions? All right, not hearing any. Um, uh, I'd like a uh, vote on uh, approving the agreement with CIESC. So all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries four to zero. 
Consider the approval of the 2020-2021 tentative agreement between Danville DLTA and DCSC. Dr. Schaefer. Yes, and I'll introduce this, and then we'll, we'll need to pause and open the floor for, for public comment uh, prior to the board uh, ratifying the contract. Um, <coughs> on September 30th, a public meeting was held uh, to review the terms of the agreement. It was held here in this room in a, in a public meeting. Um, and this, uh, tonight, the, the proposed contract for the 2021 uh, teacher contract is back before the board for final ratification consideration. Um, prior to that vote, uh, the, the Indiana statute does require that we provide a time for public comment on the agreement. Um, but before we do that, generally the agreement provides for um, essentially uh, five different tenants. Um, one, a salary increase for our teachers, which would range uh, between about $1,700 and $1,900, depending on the level of evaluation performance of the teacher who taught for us last year. Uh, it increases a beginning teacher base pay for beginning teachers by about $1,500 to a new base of $41,500. Uh, third, uh, provides for select middle school teachers that are teaching in our DCSC online program a stipend for their dual role in doing that. Uh, it provides compensatory pay to teachers who are providing sub-coverage for other teachers during their prep time when, when substitute teachers cannot be found. And lastly, it extends the early retirement notice stipend for teachers, which has been in our contract. It extends that opportunity by one year. And I, I would like to say I really appreciate the work of uh, both of our bargaining teams. Um, I know um, uh, Corey and, and Mr. McRoberts, uh, we're, we're part of our team, and uh, uh, Mr. Parkinson, as well as the teachers that served on the, on the committee, and very amicable, amicable, productive conversations. Um, you know, during a very challenging year and, and potential years ahead, budget-wise. So we really appreciate their cooperation and work, and, and just a level of professional conversation. Uh, and both teams really work to maximize the compensation to our teachers, while also planning forward for a, a tight biennial, biennial budget upcoming. So we are pleased to be able to provide uh, the salary increase. And uh, Mr. Stewart, at this time, we should probably pause and, and open the, the floor to public comment on the proposed uh, contract uh, prior to ratification. Okay, very good. So we'll close the floor. Do we need to actually, uh, Mr. Kessinger, do we need to close the meeting and open public meeting or just uh, hold? That would, that would be fine. Okay, we'll close the, the, our regular uh, scheduled meeting, our regular uh, meeting, and open the floor for public comment on the uh, contract ratification. I'll give you about another 15 seconds to decide whether <laughs> anyone wants to speak. All right. Uh, hearing no uh, uh, public comment, we will close public comment. Um, and then um, we'll start our meeting back. Um, we'll start with uh, whether we have a motion to approve the, uh, the, to ratify the contract. So I'm looking for a motion to approve or ratify the contract with uh, the teachers and uh, the school corporation. So moved. All right, we have a first, do we have a second? Second. Mr. Mason, all right, questions or discussion? I'd also like to thank the teams that did this because I, as we discussed in our last meeting last week, uh, we uh, set a record as to how fast this occurred. So uh, that shows just a continued uh, good work with the, uh, the, the board and the, the teachers and uh, thank you for everyone involved. Um, okay, uh, well hearing uh, no uh, further discussion from the public or from uh, the board, I'd like to ask for a vote. Uh, all those in favor of approving ratifying the 2020-2021 tentative uh, agreement between the DLTA and DCSC uh, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries four to zero. Agenda item 6H, declaration of school board vacancy. This one's mine. Um, we, we had uh, in our September meeting, as you all recall, uh, Amy, Comer Elliott uh, notified us that she would be eventually resigning from the school board due to um, a family move to a new home that's just outside of our district. I actually drove by that house just to make sure uh, <laughs> we couldn't keep her for a few months. I think she's a few hundred yards away. But anyway, um, in, in, uh, once she finally moved uh, a few weeks ago, she um, uh, tenured her a letter of resignation. 
And uh, so it's the role of the school board now to have 30 days to fill uh, that, that seat. The seat will be an appointment by the school board uh, starting, that member will be uh, involved starting in our November the 9th meeting and uh, carrying through to the end of the year, whatever duties arise uh, as a full school board member uh, through December 31st. And so what we will be doing is uh, meeting in either executive or public session, we'll make that note um, uh, here uh, in the next uh, week, few weeks, uh, making that determination, making that announcement, and that individual will be joining us for the November meeting on November the 9th. So that's uh, uh, our requirement is to make sure that we've announced that vacancy. Uh, obviously, we kind of gave a um, uh, you know, sneak peek to that announcement last uh, last month with uh, uh, Miss Elliott's Mrs. Elliott's um, announcement, but uh, it's become official. So we really are going to miss her uh, leadership and um, look forward to uh, uh, making this appointment in the upcoming days. Uh, Item 6I, uh, uh, consider the approval of surplus equipment, Mr. Parkinson. Uh, we, have, we have two surplus lists for the board's consideration this evening. Um, one is a set of technology that, that's outdated and no longer used by students or staff, a set of 62 HP computers, 60 monitors, um, and various other minor technology equipment. Uh, and then the other one is from North Elementary, and, and this might become a theme um, just for what it's worth over the next year or so as that project takes off. Um, and we identify a need for space and things that can go. And we've got a variety of equipment that's not used um, in the classes any longer, an old television, um, projector, other miscellaneous items. And so we'd request that the board um, consider these items or allow us to declare these items as surplus. Very good. We have a motion to uh, declare these items as surplus as presented. So moved. First, we have a second. Second. All the uh, need discussion questions. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries four to zero. Agenda item 7A, superintendent report. Dr. Schaefer. Oh, okay. yeah. Sorry. Consideration, uh, consider the approval of gifts uh, and donations to the school corporation, Mr. Parkinson. We received Sorry. a very kind um, gift, nice. gift this month from, um, from Amy Comer Elliott. Uh, she donated $500 to the school corporation and asked the, that we would use it for um, the purchase of books for our library uh, by authors of diverse backgrounds focusing on um, diverse cultures and races. So with the, the board's approval, uh, we'll be working with our librarians on procuring those books. Very good. Uh, do we have a, a motion to accept the uh, gift from Mrs. Elliott? So moved. Dr. Beatty, do we have a second? Second. Mr. Mason, questions, comments? Obviously a big thank you and a timely uh, 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 donation, thoughtful. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries four to zero. Now, Dr. Schaefer, superintendent's report. <laughs> um, just a, a two, two points I want to update the board on. The first is um, our student assessment. I know a lot of people asked, hey, being out last spring, students out from March to the end of the year, uh, how are you going to know how kids are coming in, what their learning levels are at the beginning of, of this year? And we have just uh, completed our, our traditional, typical uh, NWEA, uh, Northwest uh, assessment, that we've uh, recently had all of our kids go through from grades 2 up through grades 10, at least in math, and uh, to determine kind of where are, where are our students in terms of their learning. And uh, I appreciate Morgan Walker's work on that, as well as our building principals and uh, getting all of that coordinated and, and completed because it's a little bit challenging even now, uh, still with COVID happening, but we have been able to assess both our in-person students and our online students who are, who are with us right now. So uh, just kind of a quick rundown of that. Um, general results, results are, as, as we would imagine, uh, scores are down, um, our fall scores are down from what they were a year ago fall, but again, we're, we're still a lot of these cases, we're comparing two different cohorts of kids, but just kind of looking at how did kids do last year in second grade compared to how kids are doing this year in second grade. Uh, we would expect those scores to be down, and, and certainly they are a little bit. Um, the scores are based on a RIT, what's called a RIT score, R-I-T, which is basically a Roush unit. Um, those comparisons range approximately down about 10%, uh, that's roughly in grade three uh, on the extreme ends. Um, 
which are on, on the, our students who are maybe working a little bit lower and our students who are working higher. We're seeing about a 10% uh, change or 10% uh, decrease in our higher scores, 10% increase on the low end of those scores comparatively. Um, but when you look in the middle, you look at our middle grades, um, uh, or, or actually in, in our middle, um, the kids who are more average, working more at average level, those changes are only about 5 to 6%. Uh, so I think it's affecting the extreme ends a little bit more than it is the kids who typically would, would uh, give us average performance. Uh, and the scores are, are reported in a range. We go from low to low average to average to high average to high. So there's really five different um, transitions across there. So the lows and highs are off a little bit more than our average areas are. Um, again, not probably not surprising when we look at it, but that's what we're seeing right now. Now our middle grades, like grades six and seven, uh, that range is more about five to nine percent difference. It's not quite as high as our younger kids. I mean, think about it. The middle middle age kids have been in school longer. Uh, they probably handled the transition a little bit better. They're not quite so dependent on that direct instruction from the teacher as a second or third grade student would be as they're entering school at an earlier age. Uh, our what we found was our reading scores had a little less impact. Uh, with third grade, again, uh, not surprisingly showing the most impact. Uh, grades four through nine showed a little bit of drop from a year ago, but it was much less pronounced. It was more than a three to seven percent drop in their scores. So math got hit a little harder than reading. Reading got hit a little harder at third grade as those kids are still learning to read. A um, little bit of difference there. Um, I step predictiveness. In other words, you can take the NWEA score and use it to begin to predict what that I-STEP outcome will look like too. Now again, with I-LEARN, new test, there's a new realignment between NWEA and I-LEARN. So we're, we're not 100% sure how well that'll align. After we take that test three or four years under I-LEARN, that alignment will get tighter, uh, the correlation will. So right now there's a little bit of a little bit of guesswork in that. But the predictiveness is also measured, and that range is larger. Uh, we're down about 15 percentage points of the students we would predict now in the fall to uh, pass iLearn uh, in the spring. That's at grade three. Uh, down about 12% at grade six, and down about 7% at grade eight. Again, we see the impact a little higher on the younger students, a little bit less being out of school uh, for the older students. Um, and our reading, uh, our reading changes range in about the 13 percent uh, range at grade three uh, and down to as little as uh, only a two percent difference at grade eight so again with reading we're seeing more impact with younger students and, and quite actually quite little impact when you get up to seventh and eighth grade so again just a kind of a quick overview so you have an idea of how the kids are doing coming back in based on our nwea assessment uh, second thing i wanted to give a brief update on is our north um, building project at North Elementary. Uh, we did hold the bid uh, openings on September 23rd, and right now uh, construction management and the architects have been reviewing the bids uh, and looking to what we would call value engineer where they can. Uh, we're currently about $750,000 over our planned budget. We haven't started any construction yet, but right now with the bids coming in, you add those up uh, compared to the work proposed and we need to reduce our budget by about $750,000. Um, so we're looking for places to uh, reduce um, the type of material or some of the pricing that's, that's in some of those bids. So there's a process they go through working with those, um, with the low bidders to determine can other materials be substituted, can some changes be made to lower the overall cost. And then secondly, we look at are there areas of the project to reduce the scope of the project as needed so that because we will stay within that 5.35 million dollar budget it's not an option to go over <laughs> so either um, some of the uh, pieces within that project work has to change uh, or we have to reduce the project work in certain areas of the building to, to meet that budget uh, we did not receive a glass and window bid um, so those are being rebid by law we have to put those back out for rebid and those bids are slated to be opened in late october uh, so that's going to extend our start date of the project by about three weeks while we wait for those bids to go back out and come back in. And I think that's just a function of the, the construction labor market right now and material availability 
Uh, we, we do feel like we're going to have some companies uh, bid on that, but nobody was able to submit a bid for the first round, so we'll, we'll do it again. But just to kind of give the, the board and the public an, a quick update on that North Elementary building project. That's all I have. Thank you. Discussion. Obviously, on your one of your updates, I think it was last week, we talked about the lack of a glass and window bid and, and some of the challenges with costs. Um, you know, it's one of the decisions we made was to move forward with a project like this, uh, even the, in a difficult time. So we're going to have to be creative uh, in, in order to uh, to accomplish what we need to accomplish. You'd mentioned something, and if you could uh, maybe expound upon this in our in your last weekly meet, uh, update with regards to um, work in the newer part of North Elementary versus. Uh, meaning the gym, uh, mm -hmm. versus some of the other areas. Could you expound upon that? Sure. Um, as I mentioned, one one approach we'll take to reducing that budget is to perhaps change the scope of it. Uh, one thing that's planned right now, for example, in the project was to refinish the flooring in there, update some paintings and things like that in the gym. Being that's a newer area of the building, that would be one of the things on the list that we'll look to hold off on. In other words, if we, you know, we're going to put our money back into the academic area of the building and the operational area of the building uh, in terms of, you know, uh, pumps and classrooms, spaces like that, those areas will come first. So the gym might be an area where we can take that portion of the budget, set that aside, and put those dollars into other areas of the building. So what we're doing right now is creating a list, a prioritized list of those types of things that if we need to reduce the scope, those types of things get reduced first because they are lower priority. Uh, go ahead. What, I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, when you start talking about changing material, are we talking about less costly material or cheaper material? Uh, yeah, I'm glad you asked that because I, uh, yeah, I probably I don't want to get into using cheap materials. Uh, it'll be things like, like in the bathrooms, for example. Right now, we're slated to put wall tile on certain areas. Instead, what we may do is eliminate tile but use a really durable epoxy-based type of paint, which is similar to what's in there now. Um, again, it, it won't look quite as nice, uh, but it will be functional and durable, uh, and it will have lesser cost. Some of the flooring, right now we're looking at a rolled vinyl flooring like you might see in a doctor's office, those types of things, which is a great material. But instead, we may go back to the, the, like the white VCT tiles, for example, that are in the building now. Uh, they're much less expensive. Uh, again, they don't look quite as nice, but they're durable and they will last. Uh, so we, we're looking at making some substitutions such as that in that value engineering piece. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the NWEA or actually early testing work that we're doing. Um, you know, this is a conversation we've had over and over again, and it's the challenge that every school faces. But we've had, you know, not only a, a challenging start and a unique start to this school year, but with having so many students out, well, all of our students out since early March last year, uh, the concern is always during the summer and even in March, uh, not knowing how long we'd be out, is what do we do to remediate? And um, as going through that, um, I wanted to, first of all, thank the teachers and uh, the admi administrators and the principals on the work that we're doing to, one, obviously recognize the obvious, which is children are behind, um, but then two, putting together those plans to uh, catch kids up. And if I hear a just a, a word of encouragement, but then also uh, maybe some focus, uh, if I hear the biggest complaint with regards to um, whether it was something about being quarantined for a few weeks or whether it was because of missing the end of last uh, year, at least with in-person instruction, is that my kid's behind. And I think that we have this sense, that feeling of being behind a bit. And so um, uh, just encouraging you from a communication standpoint, whatever we can do to continue to tell the stories of, of the many uh, changes that we're making in order to uh, bring, bring students up to speed. Obviously, you mentioned some examples like, 
you know, ch a child in second grade um, learning, you know, basic read, uh, basic mathematics and, and, and reading skills and compared to a child maybe that's, you know, didn't get a whole year of biology but now is in advanced biology. <laughs> it's hard to do the advanced biology if you didn't do it and vice versa. So that communication, I guess, is what I'm encouraging. It would be, I think, very valuable to our parents as they're uh, sensing what we've sensed from the first day we were closing school that we know children are going to fall behind a bit off of pace, at least what normal pace is. Yeah, our, our, our best response to that right now is exactly what we're doing. If children can be there every day and uh, work directly with the teacher, you know, the, the numbers I'm looking at, they're, they're not where we want to be, but they don't cause me great alarm either uh, because I know our teachers are doing a great job and can catch those kids up as we work through the course of the year and get them back, you know, most of them already on grade level, but if they're behind a little bit, catch them up. Uh, we'll look for more opportunities as we get a little deeper into the year. If we see individual students or very small groups of students who are needing additional remediation to, to provide that to them. Uh, but right now, that, that child being in touch directly with a classroom teacher is the best way to ensure that they're going to finish this year uh, in good standing. Uh, I would imagine that the I learn will be really interesting, but I imagine that the I learn numbers will be really difficult because, as we've seen, that's most that's a, a more difficult test first, you know, first attempt at it, and then having the challenges that we've had. So we could see a, a tremendous failure rate as to what we're used to with the I step, for example, having a, a very good uh, passing rate. Um, obviously, our, our competitors, if you will, or just um, co-teachers uh, around the, the, the state are going to have the same challenges. But again, I think that that's where continued communication as we head into testing season here eventually uh, will be important because the result won't be what it was for ISTEP two years ago. Um, with that, um, I'd like to spend a, a minute uh, discussing uh, in this, this section um, or giving an update. And Mr. Mason and Dr. Schaefer, if you want to join in as well, um, a follow-up with a video that we did for the teachers and conversations that we had last month. But we were able to participate in a meeting uh, over the telephone with Dr. Christina Box at the Indiana Department of Health. Uh, with uh, a lot of uh, the school uh, superintendents in the county and um, members and leadership from Hendricks Regional Health and uh, um, from the in and members of the Hendricks County Health Department, Dr. Stoprich and, and his colleagues. Um, we did discuss uh, a number of things. Um, one of the things that was discussed, which Dr. Schaefer just alluded to the importance of, not alluded to, but state, clearly stated the importance of having our students in the classroom. Um, every one of those school superintendents communicated uh, to uh, Dr. Box and her staff uh, their overwhelming numbers of children who were quarantined who have not um, um, contracted um, COVID-like symptoms. Um, it was Jim Snap at Brownsburg who mentioned on the telephone call um, that they've had uh, nearly 400 students uh, quarantined. Uh, the first 200, and I think he said 327-ish <laughs> uh, students that have come back, zero had COVID symptoms. Um, Avon uh, presented numbers that were very similar, 450 students that have come back and during their 14-day quarantine, two of those students uh, developed COVID-like symptoms. Uh, we had uh, well over 250-ish at that time uh, as well that had come back with zero symptoms. Mill Creek and Northwest Hendricks echoed the same numbers. Dr. Box also said that this wasn't a Hendricks County phenomenon, but she was hearing from other superintendents around the state of Indiana sharing that they were hearing of numbers well under 1% of students that were getting uh, quarantined were actually um, developing COVID-like symptoms. I think one of the interesting things for me as a school board member was, in listening to that was the idea that um, the, one of the rebuttals to maintaining um, not, the, the schools asked 
Dr. Box to um, consider from a statewide policy, a policy like we um, voted on um, just here short, uh, just not too long ago, to uh, shorten the um, contact tracing distance to from six feet to three feet. They asked that she would do that. She said she would strongly consider that, um, but is looking for a lot of empirical studies uh, to show that that works. At the same time, she shared with us she's uh, paying close attention to Europe, where most European uh, countries uh, have had some school uh, over the summer and also have only been observing a three foot or a one meter, so a little bit over three feet, a one meter um, social distancing distance and a one meter um, contact tracing distance. And uh, she was curious as to how well that's going for Europe as that's their standard. So we had some good discussion. Uh, she didn't change her, her uh, policy for the entire state at that time. She didn't chastise Danville for making uh, any changes to our policy or those superintendents who were asking her to consider uh, changing that. The thing that I thought was most interesting, though, was being told that uh, when Jim Snap at Brownsburg suggested that he had 370 some total kids that were out, 327 that had gotten back with zero uh, symptoms, well, that's only about you know three to five percent or a very small percentage of your school population. And I thought that was very interesting because we'd only been in school for about five weeks when we had this discussion and the idea of three to five percent of your kids being quarantined for two weeks wasn't that bad. And uh, so the re retort, uh, the rebuttal from a few of us was, well, look, the school's just, just starting and there are a number of students who have already been quarantined due to contact tracing twice and missing up to four weeks of the first six weeks of school. Um, and, and I think the understanding is, or um, in my opinion, a, a misunderstanding is that, well, those students still get to do online school. And that's what she, she said. She goes, they still get to do online learning. Um, and um, that, that's not an equivalent to in the classroom training. That's why we go to school and get our, our bachelor's and our master's and work hard and, and understand that time in the classroom as a teacher makes you better. And so uh, that's, um, that was kind of interesting to me. So I think some of the policies are being made based on, well, they're still getting an education, they're still getting online training when they're out of the classroom, but I did uh, see hope for uh, some potential changes. Mr. Mason or Dr. Schaefer, you have anything else for the rest of the board to report uh, from that conversation? I, I, I don't have anything additional. I think that's a good, uh, good summary of the, the conversation. Again, it was a, a very good uh, professional conversation all the way around. And I think each of the school superintendents in the county had an opportunity to ask questions. And, and Dr. Box uh, answered those very professionally. And as you mentioned, she wasn't ready to, to make changes at this point, but certainly stayed open to looking at uh, more data uh, that we can provide. And if she can find empirical studies, um, to, to lean on, I think she would certainly consider making that change. I, I would just add that uh, it was a good conversation. Uh, our decision and the choice that we made, I think, was backed by the frustrations that we heard from the other uh, school associates on the phone that day. Uh, for whatever reason it is, they just didn't choose to uh, stand up and make the decision that we chose to make, which that's their business to run their school corporations the way they they uh, choose to run them. I would say that Dr. Box uh, wasn't closed to the information she received, but she's living in her little medical world, and that's what she's getting paid to do. Um, it it, it uh, I'm sure is hard for her to get outside of her um, studies to make decisions outside of what that empirical evidence is showing her to where we have many other factors to think of that she uh, doesn't have to think of as far as parents and work, child and their mental awareness and, and health. Um, we have more to think about than just the virus itself. Um, and everything with Dr. Vox came back to the virus and only 
the virus. Um, she didn't mention anything about the mental health of the children. She didn't think anything about the parents and, and the balance between their work and the children being at home and, and daycare and uh, the many other things that goes along with uh, children being in school or not in school. So, but all in all, I think it was a productive uh, conversation that was a good exchange of information with her and then the area school corporations. I, I was also pleased, and maybe you'd say the same, you guys would say the same thing. I was also pleased with Dr. Stoprich's um, advocacy for the schools and for the data that we were sharing, because he started off the conversation by saying, look, um, the data here is showing us that, you know, um, the kids aren't getting sick uh, from um, that the minor exposure in, in, in school. And, he's, and he made it really clear, masks are working. <laughs> uh, and the social distancing to the extent that we're doing it. Um, so um, I was encouraged by that, and, and it was an, another example of, of Dr. Stoppridge, I think, doing his very best to be a, a partner uh, with the schools and, and with our students and their parents, um, but also understanding the challenges that um, uh, the state's facing right now as well. So we'll see what she does. But uh, I was encouraged, especially with her, her eyes on some of the early studies that she's getting out of Europe. So certainly that's good. All right. So I wanted to share that with you guys. So, okay. Um, uh, legislative updates. Mr. McRoberts. I have no report. Okay. Very good. Community input. Uh, no one has signed up uh, for community input. I still will get, leave it open for a minute if someone would like to come and um, uh, state, share an idea or concern. Seeing none, we'll close community input. Uh, any other announcements? Not for me. Thank Hearing you. none, um, i like a motion to adjourn. So moved. Uh, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Second. All those in favor, signify by